Good morning, everyone. So welcome to our coffee talk. Today's topic is um, uh, going to be presented by our uh, energy educator for Clackamas County Weatherization Services, Kurt Torgerson. He, is, um, he has a background in petroleum engineering and technology. He's been with the county for 13 years, teaching people how to reduce their utility costs and conserve energy. Um, he's presented in community groups and in student classrooms and um, does home visits with people who can't get out to get to the classes. Um, he is going to tell you a little bit about um, how to qualify for weatherization services and I'm um, going to just hand it over to Kurt and he can get started. Oh, I also wanted to let everybody know that we are, the County Cable is filming the presentation. So if you have questions, please raise your hand and then wait for a microphone to come your way so that we have, a, it makes for better quality video. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Corrine. Uh, I'm Kurt, been doing this for a bit with uh, the county here. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, a little bit of the history of the program, uh, where we came from, uh, where we're at now, how the process works. Going to talk about uh, uh, the application process, the income qualifications. And uh, then I'm going to share some big picture stuff because we're all in this together and uh, some information that I also share with our customers. We, we don't call them really clients, but we call them our customers. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll get some insights into our program and also some energy saving tips so you can start using immediately to save energy. So with that, and I hope it's not too boring. So with that, uh, a short history, and I'm not gonna read every slide because I call that death by PowerPoint when someone reads everything, but I am gonna read some of these slides. Uh, the Clackamas County Weatherization Program had its origins in the CETA program, which was in 1973. It's the Comprehensive Education Training Act signed by President Nixon in 73. One of the things was to train people to go out and do certain jobs, and they let local communities pretty much dictate uh, what type of job and job training they would do. Clackamas County was pretty early, I think it was 74, 75, right in there before my time here, uh, that they did the CETA program. And this developed into the Weatherization Assistance Program in 1976 in the state of Oregon. And initially, most of the measures were things that energy educators around the state do, like air sealing, caulking, storm window kits, things of that nature to encourage homeowners and allow them to start saving energy immediately. Now, one of the things you got to remember is that in 73, that was the first oil embargo that we had. And that was a big shock to the United States because there were gas lines. Um, and all of a sudden, they realized that our energy supply wasn't infinite. And so beginning in things like 74, uh, states started passing laws on insulation requirements and things of that nature because it was a big wake-up call. And... Part of the process was energy education. It wasn't just go out and do some hardware things, but also training people how they can use things more efficiently and through conservation. So today, uh, the audit analysis process is a much more complicated and, and building science-based process than it used to be. We used to go out and just sort of look for things uh, that we thought were bad and try and fix them. Now we track them down, we use infrared cameras, we use uh, blower door machines and all sorts of things where we can actually document what we found. Um, we were a crew-based program until 2013 here at the county and now we are a contractor-based program where our work is done by contractors that are private contractors that have applied and qualified uh, through our procurement program with, with the state. So uh, we were a crew-based program for many, many years, but uh, it got too expensive. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about efficiency and conservation because we need to get those two terms. Efficiency is basically hardware improvements. For example, LED light bulbs, newer refrigerators, uh, newer television sets, that's hardware stuff. And that's what our contractors primarily focus on is hardware improvements. Conservation is saving 
through control points. And that's where I come in on my job is basically you can have a very efficient house and run it very inefficiently. And uh, so uh, I can give all kinds of <laughs> examples of that, but both are a fundamental to the holistic approach. We look at the whole house now as a integrated model of different systems and technology is constantly changing. Um, everybody in here is familiar with LED light bulbs, right? Okay, you can get LED light bulbs now that have a camera with Wi-Fi that you screw into your porch. So it's an LED camera, uh, a light source. There are LED light bulbs that are Wi-Fi repeaters to extend the range of your Wi-Fi. So technology is constantly changing, so it's difficult at, at some times to uh, keep on top of this. And then indoor air quality is the thing I'm going to touch on as well, because that's really important with the weatherization process. In the past, we made homes too tight in some cases. And once the ventilation is, falls below a certain level, indoor air pollution, carbon dioxide, moisture, mold, uh, CO2 levels, all can become a problem. So integral to the weatherization program, and this is something that we have to tell all of our customers, is that we were going to install some continuously running ventilation in your home. So uh, that's part of the process. Okay, process uh, is outlined on that flyer that uh, everybody should have on the weatherization process. Basically, you can apply through paper or online. We have a wait list, and that can be 12 to 24 months. So it can, you might be on the wait list for a while. And part of the reason for that is we have waiting factors that the state uh, encourages us to use. People with disabilities, elderly defined as 60 years old or older, and people with children. Uh, all those are waiting factors that uh, uh, are on our process. We work closely with energy assistance, uh, and uh, they do our income qualification for us. And uh, once your name comes up on the list, we make preparations for an auditor, and he or she will go out and do what I was talking about, the science-based home energy audit. This could take four to six hours because they have to set up uh, blower doors, they have to take measurements, look at windows, floors, ceiling, go in the crawl space, go in the attic, and document all of that stuff. And then how it works is they take all that data back to the office and they will work on it for oftentimes several days and it goes into a computerized audit program. That's what this REM design calculation thing there is. And what that does is tells us what cost-effective measures do. And for example, everybody wants windows, but in most cases, unless the windows are broken or really bad, they don't buy. Um, in my case, in my house, I live in a 1929 house here in Oregon City, and uh, windows were new windows for my home were going to cost $16,000. And the payback time was going to be 61 years. <laughs> so that's not very cost effective. So uh, windows oftentimes don't make it, they fall out. Then we uh, auditors develop a scope of work. They do walkthroughs with the contractors. We do bidding. And then this is new to us because since 2013, we've had been contractor based. We have to do inspections periodically. When we were crew based, you know, we could just have crew members and we knew they were pretty much installing the measures correctly. But now with contractors, uh, we have to do continuous work and inspection, energy education, and then savings. And so that's the process. And that's one of the few slides I'm going to read everything on. <laughs> uh, but uh, here's our income guidelines. And this is also online. If you go on that website through HCS, we're with children, families, and community connections. And it's 200% of the uh, poverty level here. So for a household size of one, the gross annual income can only be uh, $24,980 or less. And uh, this is for the 2019 program year. And it goes up, a family of four can be 51,000, et cetera. And uh, energy assistance does this qualification. Here's uh, one of our applications that we've got. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's real simple. It's a single page form to get on our wait list or online. And I would encourage people to uh, apply online because uh, it saves the paper, they don't have to mail it, 
And that's a great way to uh, go. And it's simple. It's, uh, we're trying to make this simple. And more and more people are online. It's a lot of seniors that do the paper route still. So, uh, and we also uh, work with the senior centers, Sandy, Malala, Canby, and they oftentimes will give us referrals. So uh, here's the statistics for last year, uh, the 2018 fiscal year. We did 84 completions. Um, we saved about $63,000 in utility costs. That's gas and electric. 50 seniors were served, 44 homes with children, uh, and 39 people with disabilities were served. And one of the things I want to mention is that uh, we've been targeting this year people with disabilities, uh, particularly in energy education. What that means is, is a lot of these folks are homebound. They cannot make it to a class for whatever reason. Uh, so it's been very rewarding for me because I do home visits and workshops. And these home visits, we have targeted uh, disabled folks. And I can go into the home and do a one-on-one -on -one look at their situation. What do they need? Uh, change light bulbs for them. Uh, give them shower timers and all sorts of things to help them start saving energy right away and motivate them. They're very glad oftentimes that someone cares to even come and see them. So it's, uh, it's been really good. And uh, we did, I think, 50 families, 50 households this last year between energy assistance and myself on the uh, uh, home visitations with disabled folks. Now, efficiency improvements, as I mentioned before, are hardware items. This is things like light bulbs, appliance updates, air sealing, and uh, refrigerators. We replace a lot of refrigerators. Uh, and particularly air sealing and insulation upgrades. Those are the two biggest bangs for the buck that we get. Air sealing, number one, you have to do that first, and insulation upgrades. Um, it's tragic, but we have a lot of people who have invested in windows, again, and they spend thousands of dollars on windows and they see no change in their heating bill. Whereas that same amount of money applied to air sealing and insulation could have made a profound difference. So that's part of the education process. Air sealing, insulation, big bang for the buck. Now here in Oregon, check this out. This is from the EPA. This is LED light bulb adoption rates. West Coast is leading the country. And part of that is because the Energy Trust of Oregon has subsidized LED light bulbs. So they're cheaper here and they're promoted here much more than they are in other parts of the country. So uh, our adoption rate is above 40% of households. So we still got a long ways to go. I still go to a lot of households where they have just one or two LED light bulbs, but uh, uh, our adoption rate is the highest in the country here on the West Coast. And it makes a huge difference. This changing of a single light bulb multiplied by all the households in Oregon can make, as I'll show you by mathematic example, an enormous difference in our power load. Now, before we get too smug, though, and talk about changing light bulbs and saving energy, we need to look at some force in numbers and then maybe make a comparison with Germany because we still got a long ways to go. An 8-watt LED has the same light output in lumens as a 60-watt incandescent light bulb, 8 or 9 watts. Uh, the ones I give out are 8 watts, and they're supposed to last 13.7 years, uh, which is much longer than the 1,000 hours or 1.4 hours uh, of a typical incandescent light bulb. So I'm not going to go through all the math here, but basically Oregon has 1.8 million housing units. That's homes, mobile homes, apartments. And the average Oregon home uses 960 kilowatt hours a month, almost a megawatt hour a month. And if you look at the light bulbs on the, on the box, they figure that the average home uses it three hours a day. A little bit more in the winter, a little bit less in the summer. So if you do the math, basically replacing one 60-watt light bulb per household, every household in Oregon, every 1.8 million, equals 8,300,000 kilowatt hours saved. That's, a, that's enough to do 8,700 homes just by changing one light bulb. So that's, that's how there's force in numbers. And that's why uh, it's really important that we look at energy efficiency things. So the benefits are, yeah, we save money, we've got environmental benefits, and there's less need for new power plants to be installed. 
Now, if you look at the CIA's website, and you can actually go to their website and get data on countries besides uh, intelligence operations that they do, they collect data. And one of the things that they collect is, in the USA, every person that lives here, they took the total amount of energy, electrical energy produced, divided by the total number of people, and we use 11,800 some kilowatt hours per person per year. It's a lot because we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> we have a lot of gadgets and uh, refrigerators and TVs and stuff. In Germany, though, their similar standard of living and the German uh, climate is similar to the Willamette Valley, like the Alps are similar to the Cascades, etc. They use 56% of the energy that we do, electrical energy. And they're not exactly like living in caves and stuff. So it's not rocket science. It's through conservation and efficiency, where we have the free market basically dictating, you know, saving energy on light bulbs. They're much more uh, promotional, I guess, in saying you can't use those old light bulbs. You have to use the new ones. And efficiency measures are real big. So um, we got a ways to go on energy efficiency. There's always room for improvement. And even in Germany, they're still talking about ways that they can continue to save energy. And here's the mix. When we go to a home, I mentioned the holistic approach that we look at. We look at the home in three different ways. First of all, we look at the structure of the home. The floors, walls, ceiling. What keeps the cold air out and the warm air in. And the amount of insulation, etc. The next thing we look at is the mechanicals. How is the home heated? Is it baseboard electric heat? Real basic stuff sort of a legacy of our cheap electricity we have here, or is it forced air, mechanical, gas, etc.? And how efficient is that system? And then finally, the occupants. And this is just as important as the other two. The occupants are where I come in, and some of our auditors do with the energy education. Um, these are kind of extreme examples, but I'll give you an example. We had a home we weatherized a few years ago in Sandy, and it was about this time of year, about Thanksgiving, we got a call from the woman whose home we weatherized, and she said, you guys must have messed up because my heating and electric bills went up after you weatherized the home. Well, that's not supposed to happen. So they sent me out there to look. And I went out there, and uh, she had a living room window about half the size of one of those wide open and a boards coming down into the middle of the living room floor. And I'm like, what's that for? And she says, well, that's so the cats can get in and out. She just wiped out the insulation that we added in the ceiling because that heated air was just zooming out the window. Now, she didn't do it intentionally, you know, but uh, people don't oftentimes understand the building dynamics and how things work. So normally I don't preach. Normally I like to just give information out so people can make their own informed decision. But in this case, I'm like, no, you got to shut the window. <laughs> Get a cat door or something. And then once that happened, all the savings came up uh, that we were anticipating. And the savings predictions are anywhere from 12 to 30% typically on a home. And that does several things. If you're saving 12 to 30% on your uh, utility bills, you have money for other things. Some of our seniors have to make the tragic choice at the end of the month between heating and eating. And uh, they'll turn down the heat. They will. And uh, they'll have problems. So occupants are just as important as the other two. So what uses the most energy in your home? Anyone want to jump in? Heating and cooling. Yeah, heating and cooling is the number one. No matter what your heating source is, wood, electric, gas, etc. That's your number one use of energy, and that's the biggest uh, energy savings typically that we receive in the house. How about number two? Water heating. Water heating is number two because water has such a high specific heat. It's very takes a lot of energy, lots of watts or lots of joules to raise the temperature of water. And so it, it is always, unless something really unusual is going on, the number two use of energy in the home is water heating, number two, space heating, number one. And then number three is kind of lumped everything together, lights, appliances, uh, gadgets. Um, for years, it was the refrigerator was number three. Space heating, water heating, refrigerator. Remember those old uh, 
Well, if you're old like me, they, those old avocado and harvest gold refrigerators from the 70s, I still see those in garages that are running. And they've got one 12 pack of soda in it, and they don't realize that's a 20 to $22 a month fridge. That's $240 a year. A modern fridge, a replacement, say 18 cubic feet, is about $60 a year. That's a big difference versus 240. And when I tell people that, they're like, I'm getting rid of that. <laughs> I'm unplugging that right now. They can start saving right away. So that's an example of what I'm talking about. And that's hardware again. That's efficiency is hardware. Conservation is through control points. And you can go online and there's lots of different graphs, lots of different versions of this. But basically, space heating and cooling is number one. Water heating is number two. And you'll see that refrigeration and lighting are going down every year. And the reason is efficiency. We're getting rid of those old fridges, and we're installing new lights, particularly as you saw on the West Coast here. So that's a big difference. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that people use, like battery chargers and things like that, that are just sort of like in the other category. Computers are also getting more efficient. So um, it's the big space heating, cooling, water heating are the, are the big ones now. OK, so when you look at your electric bill, your build in PGE or Canby utility, anybody here from Canby? OK. PGE is an uh, investor-owned utility. And it's around, right now, 12 cents per kilowatt hour if you add up all the charges. It's, it equals out to about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's 1,000 watts for one hour is a kilowatt hour. 1,000 watts for one hour. And that's the billing unit. So a 9-watt LED that we give out can run 111 hours before it uses a kilowatt hour. Portable electric heaters, which a lot of people are using this time, they're 1,500 watts, typically on high. And so that's only 40 minutes before you burn up a kWh. And then clothes dryers are typically three to 5,000 watts, three to five kilowatts per hour. So, but they're not on that much. Uh, but uh, they can burn up a kilowatt hour in just 12 minutes on a 5 kW. 5 times 12, 60. So um, it's important to know the kilowatt hour or the watt hour rating of your appliances and light bulbs and stuff. Now, you'll all recognize this. This is a PGE electric bill. And it's uh, just one off their website. It's, a, uh, you know, it's not a real one. But typically, in an electrically heated home, you'll see this histogram or histograph it should look kind of like a smiley face. You're looking at lots of uh, heating. Remember, heating, cooling in the wintertime and less in the summertime. And when I do a home visit, and you get this yourself when you go home, you might want to take a look at this because here's one I made up, basically. And uh, I've got it through the calendar year, January through December. And we see this a lot. Now, here is the base load. And typically, September and May are pretty much what we call baseload months, if you want to know. This is the stuff you do every day, every week, over and over. It's the water heating, the showers, the laundry, the lights, the refrigerator. That's the baseload. And they're very repetitive. People's habits don't really change a whole lot unless they get new uh, efficient models. This doesn't change a whole lot. So. Uh, the baseload improvements can only be done through hardware and some, some uh, conservation. The stuff above the baseload is heating load. That makes sense? So you can look at that and sort of say, OK, this is the heating load. This is the opportunities I have to save the most money, most, uh, most energy. And that's air conditioning. See that in the summer? So this is increasing in Oregon a lot as both as climate change occurs and more and more people, even low income people, are buying air conditioners, window mounts, uh, portables. And so anytime it gets above 80 degrees, we see a big increase in uh, air conditioning loads. And uh, uh, this is not unusual. Um, but with climate change and things like that occurring, this is probably going to be uh, increasing load in the, uh, in the summertime. The unfortunate part is, is a lot of low-income folks can't afford a new air conditioner, so they buy an old 
used, inefficient one that's cost them a lot of money. And uh, it's inexpensive up front, but the operating costs are real high. So that's, that's a problem. Now, this isn't as complicated as it looks. <laughs> this slide looks rather complicated, but let me talk about this. This is what an energy educator like myself typically focuses on when we go to a home. Um, and I go to a lot of apartments, by the way, and uh, one thing I do want to mention is that uh, oftentimes in apartments, we don't weatherize apartments beyond about a fourplex. And the reason is, is that uh, two-thirds, 66.6% of the people in that apartment complex, if we were to do the whole thing, have to be low income, and they have to apply for the program. And uh, uh, during the ARA program, uh, we did a few apartments that were specifically for low income, but oftentimes they don't get the weatherization services except for energy education. So what I do is when I go to a home, I look at what we call control points and set points. And these are things like the thermostat on the water heater, the sinks and the showers. If you limit your shower time, you can't make your shower much more efficient except by hardware change, changing the, you know, to a low flow shower head. But the time you use the shower is just as important as the hardware. A five minute shower versus like a 20 minute shower. Um, same thing with dishwasher, oven, TV lights, lights you have on off switches. So I focus on control points and behavior changes, if that makes sense. And that's what I really recommend to people even before weatherization occurs. You can go out and say, look, if you limit the thermostat settings in particular, remember that's the biggest load is heat load, turn down the thermostat at night, um, Lots of times people will have TVs on that are uh, elderly to keep them company. And they'll have a big 55 inch plasma or LED TV on 14 hours a day. And that uses more than their fridge in some cases because they're 400 watts and it's on all the time. Fridge cycles on and off. So oftentimes that's the number three use and they're not looking at it, it's just making noise. So that's one of the things that uh, I don't, again, try to preach to people, but I let them make an informed decision. And so control points are what people look at in terms of conservation. Efficiency, again, is hardware improvements. So what can you do about this? Um, in our program, we really like our customers to get involved with the process. So during the audit process, the auditor will say to the customer, you know, here's some information on mold, moisture, uh, energy. And this is what I found. Your home's pretty leaky or no, it's pretty tight. And uh, this is what I'm proposing we do. You know, it's not locked down in what we do until we do the uh, computerized audit. But what can you do? Well, as a homeowner, there's actually a lot of stuff you can do for example, first thing we want to do is find and seal the leaks in the home. And this is from the EPA. It's a great diagram. And um, uh, I call her Catwoman. You remember the story I was telling you about the cat lady with the open door or open window and the boards? Well, <laughs> I, in my 1929 home, have a fireplace that has no damper in it. So I'm just as bad as she was for a long time. So for like seven years, I was heating air in my house and it was going up the chimney due to what we call the stack effect. And uh, I was horrified because I'm playing around with what we call a smoke pencil and all of a sudden I can see living room air going towards the furnace or the fireplace and then whoop, zoom up. So uh, I made a plug at a styrofoam and I plugged my chimney uh, and my heating bill dropped 9%. So that's significant. And I only forgot to take it out once when I built a fire. <laughs> so this diagram, though, shows heated air rises. Uh, heat goes from hot to cold. And oftentimes, attic hatches aren't sealed, flashings around chimneys. Uh, recessed lights oftentimes are uh, very leaky. People like recessed lights nowadays, particularly in newer construction. And they just have holes in ventilation that goes straight up into the attic space. And uh, oftentimes, they're little chimneys. And so we spend a lot of time before we insulate air sealing those as well. The other thing is, is if the heated air comes, goes out, some air has got to come in to replace it. Cold air from the outside or even worse, crawl space air. 
Uh, crawl space air that goes into the home is the air that we do not want to come in the house. It is moist. It oftentimes has mold spores. Uh, critters might be down there. Um, and also radon in certain areas. Even here in Clackamas County, out in the uh, boring area, there's sort of some radon hot spots out there. So we don't want that air. We would much rather have air leak around doors and windows than crawl space air. But if we can slow down the air going out of the house, we can slow down the air coming into the house and vice versa. If we find air coming into the house, we can slow it down the outlet. Ideally, we want to do both again without compromising the indoor air quality. How do we find the leaks? I'll be wondering, what is this slide all about? Well, in the conventional building science, we use what's called a blower door. And we actually close all the doors and windows in the home. And we put a blower door in the front door, and it has a sealed gasket around there. And we turn on and try and suck air out of the house until the air pressure drops about a quarter inch of water. Very little, down to what they call 50 pascals, but about a quarter inch of water column. And then we can measure the flow through that fan. And once we start air sealing the home, we'll do that test again and again, and we can actually document how tight we're getting the house through air sealing and caulking and weather stripping. Now, I don't have a blower door. They're about 2000 bucks plus. But homeowners can do a similar test themselves. And oftentimes when I do home visits, I'll take along um, what I call a smoke pencil. That's what this is. And it's just a, a cotton wick that you light, and it puts off a trail of smoke. Now, if you want to do this or encourage your customers to do this, they can use an incense stick, get something they like the smell of, and light, close all the doors and windows in the home, and turn on the exhaust fans that go to the outside. So if you have a bath fan that goes outside, turn it on high. Your kitchen fan goes outside, not just the recirculation kind, turn it on high. And you're reducing the air pressure in the home. Now, if you have a little leak or a crack in the wall here, and you suspect air is coming out, by turning on the fans, it makes that leak a bunch worse, and you light the incense stick, Hold it there, and you'll see the smoke move quickly. And you can typically do a whole home. I do a lot of uh, two-bedroom apartments in less than 20 minutes with the smoke pen. And, and a home might take a little longer because you have cabinets and stuff to get in the way. And we check around the doors and the windows, the attic hatches, those, those areas I showed you were typical leakages. And you can spot it pretty quickly. If the smoke's just lazily moving up, you don't have a problem. But you'll see when you got a leak, it will move pretty quickly. And it's easy to do, and it really empowers homeowners because oftentimes when they see that leak, they want to fix it right away. And that's motivating them. That's part of my job. Now, the major sources of air leaks, yeah, fireplace, that's me. <laughs> Electrical outlets, they're only 2%. Remember those gaskets people used to give out? You take off the, the plate and stick the gasket on. There's usually bigger fish to fry because that's 2%. Uh, plumbing fireplace, doors, windows, and then just plumbing penetration, just where the cable comes in, the telephone comes in, pipes come in. Those are all big leakers. And one of the things that I really encourage people to do is if they open their kitchen sink and they feel cold air, look for uh, air leaks around the pipes. That's a, that's a real common one. And something they can fix. Again, they, they feel empowered. They're part of the process, and uh, we encourage that in the weatherization program for our customers not to just sit back and do nothing, but to actively be involved in the process. Now, one of the things that I do, um, and I think we're probably about the only agency in the state that does this, is when I do a home visit, I ask the customer, would you mind if I check the indoor air quality? And they're like, usually almost always, sure, let's do it. So I use a particulate counter, and it, uh, doesn't say what the particles are, but it tells me if the home's unhealthy. Like if smokers are there, oftentimes you'll see really high counts of uh, fine particulates. And the stuff below about two and a half microns, when you breathe it in, it goes into your bloodstream. It's not trapped by the lungs. And so when we had the forest fires last year, we had really bad air quality. I mean, you could see a huge difference from indoors to outdoors. We also look at relative humidity 
and carbon dioxide because we breathe off carbon dioxide at about 4% in our breath. And when I go into a home and you say, man, it feels humid and just kind of, you know, heavy air in here. If the CO2 level's high, um, that means they're not ventilating. The fans aren't working or something else is going on. And so uh, that's a real good indication of indoor air quality, particulates and CO2. Uh, oftentimes we get the smell of mold and mildew because those things follow high humidity levels. Mold can't exist without water and humidity. So uh, the mold spores are everywhere. But if we can get rid of the moisture through education and sometimes efficiency hardware improvements, that makes all the difference. Uh, we also test for lead paint pre-1978 homes because particularly if we're going to do any work where we might disturb that paint. So again, we have to uh, let the homeowners know if they have lead paint because we don't want to disturb it or have our contractors do it. And then we have a lead contamination problem. And that's real common in Oregon. Uh, my home's got nice lead painted windows that I have to wipe up, never use a vacuum on because then it just sprays the dust all over the house. So there's a lot to it. Um, now on the yellow sheet that I handed out, those are free and low cost ways to uh, save energy that you can share with your customers. First of all, you've probably heard this many times before, but with electrically heated homes, turning down the thermostat at night and when you're away can make a huge difference in your bill, like 10% or more. Uh, in my case, it was 11%. I got a programmable thermostat. I heat with gas, and it turns the temperature down to 62 degrees. And typically, I don't like to go much below that. On I, I, I have customers that uh, will turn their heat down to 55 in the wintertime for long periods, and they start getting moisture and condensation problems on the window because it's below the dew point. And you'll see the black mold start occurring on the aluminum window frames because they're the coldest part of the aluminum or the uh, uh, window in the house is that aluminum because it's so conductive and it sweats and it produces moisture and it's a mold generator. So 60 degrees is what I usually recommend uh, people lower their thermostat. My wife says 62 is as low as it's going. So that's what it is. And uh, similarly, if you're running a cooling thermostat, run it at 78 or, or as high as you can uh, tolerate. And then, uh, yeah, the fireplace damper, that was a big one. Um, we've had people that had homes that they blocked all the registers with furniture, carpets, and things like that. So the furnace is working 24-7 just to put a little bit of heat in the house. And the other thing that people commonly do, they think they're saving energy by, well, kids have moved out. I'm not going to use that back bedroom, so I'm just going to close off the registers. Just shut them down. The problem is, is that all the ducted heating systems we test, and we test those, they leak. So think of it as like a garden hose that has little cuts in it. When you have the hose just blasting out water, nothing comes out those little holes. But what happens when you put your thumb over the end of the hose? Now it squirts out where all the leaks are. The duct system is the same way. So oftentimes when you close the ducts in the back bedroom because the kids have moved out, you just pressurized the duct system, which is in your crawl space, not doing you any good, and pushing hot air into the crawl space. So I tell people don't close it more than 70%. Uh, Leave it a little bit open. Because again, mold, moisture, and uh, other things are follow that cold temperature. And uh, use shades and drapes to your advantage. When it's uh, a nice fall day and you got sunshine coming in, open the drapes. You don't have to use the lights. It's free heat, free light, and similarly close it at night. Close it in the summertime during the heating thing. That's again a control point that the homeowner has control over. I can't tell you how many homes I go to, middle of the day, and all the curtains are closed and the electric lights are on. And uh, there's some extreme examples of that, too, that I've, I've gone to. I went to one home where they actually painted everything in their living room black. The carpet, the chairs, the furniture, the ceiling, the walls, everything was black. 
And I'm like, okay, this is a little different. I, I can't see, you know, I can't see around. And what they had was like uh, Led Zeppelin and ACDC glow in the dark posters with ultraviolet lights on and they turned it on and that's what they liked. But as far as energy efficiency, it was terrible. And mobile homes are similarly. How many people here have gone into a mobile home, older one, where they have the dark paneling in the hallway? You can't see down the hallway, even with the sun shining through the window. So just painting it a light pastel color can make all the difference. You don't think of paint as saving energy, but it can, just through lighting. It can make a big difference. All right, here's uh, one of the things on technology I was going to talk about. Technology is constantly changing. So there are new thermostats out there like uh, Nest and some other brands that are out there that, uh, unlike the old programmable thermostats, remember your habits, and they can be turned on with a smartphone. And so they remember your habits like, okay, I've turned it down to 62 at night and turn it back up to 68 or whatever at 6 o'clock in the morning. And it can remember that. They're expensive, but uh, you got to not do the thermostat warp, I call it, where someone turns it up and then it's too warm, turns it down or turns it up and down. You got to, uh, I see this a lot <laughs> in homes. But the Nest thermostats and similar ones do work and uh, they're just expensive, and uh, some of the programmable ones are really tough. I uh, come across a lot of them that are very difficult to program, and uh, that's what they're trying to overcome with some of the Nest thermostats. Now, that was free stuff. That was control points. That's like shower, lights, etc. Low-cost stuff, if you got leaky doors and windows, and you can see with your smoke test or the incense test, you can see smoke or stuff around it, fix it. Um, Low-cost plastic wind storm window kits, well worth the money uh, that you can get pretty much at any big box store, and uh, that can save you a lot of money. Caulking is stuff that we use on stuff that doesn't move. Weather stripping is what you use on windows and doors that move. Caulking is things that don't move, like the window frame, the door frame, the, the area around pipes. And again, air sealing is about the cheapest thing you can do to save money in a home. So I give out a lot of caulking and caulking guns in my home visits if people can use it. And this is a caulking gun as opposed to caulking a gun. People that live in apartments oftentimes don't want to mess with their uh, landlord. And they'll say, eh, I'm not sure, so sure if they're going to let me put in weather stripping and use the caulking gun on the windows. So I also give out this and encourage people to buy this. This is called rope caulking or cord weather stripping. It's like sticky modeling clay. You do the smoke test, find the leaks around doors, window frames, and you can use this stuff, just mold it with your hands and push it in the areas and it seals those leaks up. Again, making it more comfortable and saving energy. Our goal in the weatherization program is what we call affordable comfort. We want people to be able to be warm in the winter, cool in the summer, and to be able to. That's the goal. These are good storm window kits I like uh, because this one has a little frame on it. You can just replace it. You don't have to every year reuse it. You don't have to use the hairdryer to shrink it and uh, tear it down every year. Uh, the frame type, if people are up to it, I encourage them to use that. Another thing we used to use is bubble wrap. Um, especially the big bubble wrap on single pane windows. This stuff works great. Put it on the inside, uh, use some clear tape, and uh, it is amazing how, uh, how well it works compared to a double pane window. It's, it's very similar. It's you know not the prettiest looking thing, but it still lets some light through, and uh, uh, it's cheap. Oftentimes you can get rolls of this donated by uh, uh, some manufacturers. Now, remember the number two use of energy is water heating in your home. So we set the water thermostats at 120 degrees. We measure it with a thermometer. You can do the same thing with just an ordinary cooking thermometer. It should be around 120, 125. If it's above 130, uh, we turn it down. Cold water for laundry. Um, short showers, that's a, a big one. I remember uh, my daughter used to take 20-minute showers when she was in high school at our home, and uh, I could see the difference on the bill uh, versus a five-minute shower. So 
I give out hundreds of shower timers. And so shower is a big one. Some of you may recognize this. Uh, <laughs> and that's a shower timer. Um, it's just a uh, five minute hourglass with a suction cup that sticks on the shower wall and uh, again motivates people to save energy. If I can motivate people to save energy, I have a real easy job. It's the ones that aren't motivated but complain about their high electric bills that are the tough customers. Okay, uh, low flow sh shower heads, good. Low flow is defined as two and a half gallons per minute. Um, I bought one of those ultra low flow shower heads. You know, it's like a 1.5 gallon. And it was like standing in front of a plant mister. It just didn't work very well. So it lasted about a week. So again, even if you don't have a low flow shower, a shorter shower definitely can save money. And if you have leaks, um, especially hot water leaks, you need to fix those. Um, I was just at a house last week where they had very high electric bills. And the auditor and I were poking around and we opened up the hot water cabinet. It was a manufactured home. And there was hot water spraying out of the bottom fitting. And it had been doing that for months. Well, that's very expensive because they're paying money to heat that water, which is just spraying out, going to the ground and causing mold and other issues as well. So uh, water is a big one, and especially leaky hot water. Um, Modern refrigerators are pretty efficient, as I mentioned. And the new ones, when you go to big box stores like Lowe's, Home Depot, they have digital thermostats. You know what the temperature is. And typically, it's on that yellow sheet. Your fridge should be running, thirty in bold letters, 37 to 40. And your freezer right around zero, zero degrees. I give these out because people can use it to set their thermostat in most refrigerators. It just goes zero to nine. You don't know what the temperature is on older ones. It's just zero to nine. And uh, once they set it, it pretty much doesn't change. I mean, it doesn't change over time. So they can also use this as a household thermometer because it goes from 30 below zero or 25 below zero up to 120. So you can use it as a house thermometer. It's not just stuck for a fridge thermometer. So it has, it has dual use and uh, they work pretty well. Clackamas County has also made uh, available at county libraries about 10 years ago. I got a bunch of these and uh, the Energy Trust of Oregon. And this is, again, a great empowering tool because they can, uh, it's a bad pun. I love bad puns. Kill a watt meter instead of kill a watt. And uh, you can check this out like a book at a local library for free. Take it home. Plug in, uh, uh, it's going to ask you what your electric rate is. It's 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Plug it in that old fridge in the uh, garage. Let it run overnight. Come back the next day and it's going to say it's $26 a month. Then you can make the decision. You can measure your kid's Xbox. You can look at the old TV, uh, refrigerators. Uh, and they work quite well and they're pretty easy to program. And so uh, these are available at county libraries. Or you can buy one. They're about $30 at Ace Hardware, around, around that range of hardware. Now, on appliance purchasing, Energy Star is basically the way to go. That's a, uh, a program where they actually do laboratory tests and they look at the efficiency, again, hardware of TVs, computers, ceiling fans, etc., and they rate them. And to make the Energy Star criteria, they have to have a certain efficiency, particularly with refrigerators and big uh, white goods, as they call them. Um, the other thing about Energy Star that most people don't know is in, on many items, they have an extended warranty. Because it doesn't do you any good to buy a real efficient refrigerator and then have it break down in a year, right? You didn't save any money. So they also have to have a quality factor in there. So Energy Star also has typically extended warranties and uh, things like light bulbs. Uh, you can buy LED bulbs that aren't Energy Star, but uh, that's all I give out because of the extended warranty and I know that they've done lab tests to prove uh, that they work. 
So how much can you save? It's on that uh, white sheet again. Typically, basically using our uh, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, you'll find that, okay, you got a 140 degree water heater, you turned it down to 120, that's only three bucks per month, you say. Well, that's $36 a year, pushing 40 bucks a year. And then the five minute shower instead of a 10 minute. If you shower every day, that's $6 a month. Cold water wash. And you see what happens is, is pretty soon, these things start adding up. And in most cases, it's not difficult for people without weatherizing their home to save 15 to 20 bucks a month. Now again, 20 bucks a month is $240 a year. And our low income customers don't resent the fact that they can save $240 a year just through some simple habit changes. So um, uh, unplugging the extra freezer, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that we can do and uh, we do do in weatherization, mostly hardware, and then the energy ed is the conservation, working around those control points. And that's it. Hope that wasn't too boring. <laughs> we have any questions? Yes. Okay, three's good. Mm -hmm. Yes, I give out, uh, I've got the latest, oh, I'm sorry, there's a microphone. She was asking, are Edison bulbs available that aren't, or that are LEDs? And uh, they are. Um, in fact, the latest light bulbs that I get out are uh, uh, identical to incandescent light bulbs. They're the same color temperature, the same brightness. And I actually had a guy, uh, older gentleman, that uh, didn't like the compact fluorescents, the curly ones. And he had a light fixture that had six 60-watt light bulbs in it, and it was on all the time. So that's six times 60, 360 watts, right? And he's like, young man, I'm not going to let you change those light bulbs. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll change one of them. You can't look, and you got to tell me which one I changed. He couldn't tell with the LED, the, the classic LED. And so he decided, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll accept that. So we changed them with eight uh or six, I'm sorry, six eight watt light bulbs. 48 watts instead of 360. Instant savings, he saw it on his bill the next month. So, okay. The second question is, <clears throat> you said cover air conditioners, does that include like ones that are outside, like you have the compressor outside your house? No, okay. no, that's the window mount air conditioners. Okay. A lot of times they're difficult to install and people leave them in year round. And if you do that, you want to put a cover or a garbage bag. I tell people just put a white uh, garbage bag, like a 30-gallon one, over it and just tape it because air goes right through those even, even uh, in this, in this, when they're off. Okay, third question. Okay. Thank you. Um, the kilowatt meter, you said plug it into. Mm -hmm. How do you plug it into an appliance? Oh, okay, you plug it into the light socket Where adjacent the to the appliance. Yeah, and then plug okay. the uh, appliance into it. And it's on the, uh, okay. let's see if I can find that. That wasn't the most brilliant question, but I didn't understand it. So. No, it's, that's a great question because that is, we covered a lot of stuff. Okay, so this actually has prongs on the back and it plugs into the wall. Then you plug your appliance or device into that front part. And uh, um, uh, they actually work quite well. And again, uh, it, it gives people an informed choice. So motivates them. They take away their kids' Xbox 360s. <laughs> no. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Um, you had asked about, or you had uh, commented about the indoor air quality and how do you check that if you don't have one of those machines or do you have to have that or where can you get one? You basically need the machine yeah to measure particulates relative humidities fairly easy but uh, particulates and CO2 you need you need the machine yeah and they're not cheap um, uh, well, yeah unfortunately no not at the library um, I think ours cost uh, $1,500 so it's not uh, not cheap. 
Yeah, so I teach classes for low-income renters. Um, so I have those folks in mind as I'm listening to all of this. And the thermostat thing is like such a big deal, but a lot of these people have heating systems where they might have like a low-high switch. You know, it's not based on the temperature of the room when that thing is going on and off. Do you have any solutions for someone? They don't own their home. You know, they're not going to make like a big replacement. Um, how do they? How do they work with that in the most efficient way? Yeah, that's a that's a difficult one because I see a lot of what they call comfort zone thermostats that I talk about, and it will have one like 50 degree mark, an 80 degree mark, and then it says comfort zone, and you don't know where 68 or 65 is. And the unfortunate part is they were built really stoutly. So many of them are 50 years old and still working. Or they have the uh, baseboard with just like you said, the on off switch. So what you can do in that case is basically put a thermometer in the room across from the thermostat. I mean, across from the heater. So the baseboard heaters are always under uh, exterior windows. Put it across the room, run it up until it's, it's 68 or what you want, and then turn it off and see how fast it drops in the room temperature. But you got to do that all, all every day. And uh, uh, they do make digital replacements for it, but oftentimes landlords don't want to replace it. It's expensive. You got to get an electrician in there because they're 240 volt uh, devices, but that's ultimately the way to go. They do make, and we have weatherized homes uh, where we install a new digital thermostat. Um, the thing about those comfort zones is they had oftentimes a seven to 10 degree temperature swing so you set it at 68 and it might come on at 69 and go off at 76. You know, it's all over the place. Digital ones don't do that. Good question. Thank you. Yes, she asked, do we have that other material in other languages besides English? Yes, we have those in Spanish as well. Um, I can send them to you if you see me afterwards. Yeah. yeah. I, um, and I also, I don't speak Spanish, but I do visit Spanish speaking homes and I have a, uh, basically an interpreter that comes along with me and, uh, she's really good and, uh, uh, uh at communicating, uh, with, uh, Spanish speaking. And we have our classes, uh, sometimes in Spanish and also in Russian occasionally. So bear with me because I have a couple questions. Um, as far as apartments go, I have you know window pane, like the single pane windows, mm -hmm. and get a lot of moisture and mold on the window sills. So putting in like the window kit, wouldn't that create more mold? You put it in the window kit, you dry it out first. Mm -hmm. So the moisture in most cases is coming from inside, unless the window seal is really bad. So the moisture is coming from inside. It's your breath and house plants and just shower, laundry, cooking, all that stuff. So if you dry it out, then put the, the window kit up, it's sealed. It No more moisture will come and contact that. What about cats? Well, that will stand a cat that wants to sit in the windowsill. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, most of the time, <laughs> you know, a lot of times they just leave it alone. Okay. So, but yeah, if they claw through it, it's compromised. Um, another thing. Uh, wh what is more expensive to run, like a space heater or the house heater? Because we turn our breakers off mm -hmm. that go to the house heaters so that it's we don't use those. Because we use a space heater maybe like 15 minutes just in the morning. Take the okay. So which would be like more efficient? Well, typically all electric heaters, believe it or not, are 100% efficient. It doesn't matter what type they are. Um, but it's the wattage that counts. Um, I think that Normally, hey, going way back in the memory banks, but on base, is it baseboard electric? Uh, it's like these little squares. Oh, those are can. cadets. Yeah, those are cadets. Those are very similar to uh, uh, space heaters, typically 1,500 to 2,000 watts. So you can figure basically at 1,500 watts per hour, if it's on continuously, um, is 16 cents an hour. 1.5 kilowatt hours times Does it 12. count if, you, if the breakers are still on? No, uh, I don't like to encourage that because circuit breakers are not designed to be switches. They're not designed to switch okay. a lot. So basically, I have the thermostat turned down rather than turning them on and off. Uh, and most of the cadets, the low temperature reading is 50. That's about as low as they go. So they won't, you can turn it down 
and it won't come on until the temperature drops to 50. So it's kind of a toss up, um, but there's cases where people have oil heat, they can't afford it. So what they do is comfort zone heating. They take the electric heater and when they're in the uh, kitchen, they have it there. When they move to the living room, it's there. And that's kind of a strategy to uh, uh, just heat the zone you're in. Yeah. So I think you're doing okay with the space. Okay, and what about like the difference between like a box fan mm -hmm. or one of the oscillating fans compared to a ceiling fan? Which would be more cost efficient? Ceiling fans, I'm a, to use a bad pun, a big fan of. I like ceiling fans. Typically they're 100 watts or so. And uh, box fans aren't, uh, aren't very uh, watt intensive either. Um, but I like ceiling fans because you can easily reverse them in the wintertime and induce convection and make the room more comfortable, particularly if you have an angled ceiling. They work uh, quite well. Uh, and they're out of the way and they're quiet. Uh, box fans, you know, they're noisy. You got a cord on the floor uh, and, uh, you know, it's easy to reverse them. They don't use much power. But I do like to put box fans in windows at night in the summertime. That's a great use for those because the ceiling fan can't pull in cool air from outside, but the box fan can. So uh, we actually give out box fans to uh, some of our customers for that purpose. But in general, I like ceiling fans. Okay. And one more thing is so I live in an apartment mm -hmm. and my electric bill is almost $300 a month. I've got, we've got computers, the TVs, but we try to do everything like in like the energy saving TV, stuff like that. But I'm sure it has a lot to do with the apartment itself. What can I do to kind of, well, I mean, we barely use the lights and I've replaced all the lights with LEDs. Mm -hmm. right. I even changed, we bought our own uh, washing machine that's an energy saver and had them pull the old washing machine. First of all, look at your uh, electric bill. And, and look at that graph like I talked about. Look at May and September, those are gonna be your base load months and everything above that's gonna be either heating and air conditioning. So if it's the heating, then it's gotta be thermostat controls about the best you can do in an apartment. Turning it down at night uh, to what's comfortable and same thing with air conditioning. So look at your electric bill, look at that uh, above the base load and that you're kind of stuck. You can't add insulation, you can't air seal beyond a certain point, uh, but thermostat control is gonna be your best bet. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. There's a microphone there. Um, but I was just wondering, um, do you provide services um, for families who live in apartments or is this just homes, like mobile homes and houses? Um, we do some apartment complexes, mainly duplexes and occasionally a fourplex. The, the problem is, is that everybody in the apartment complex has to apply for weatherization. And two thirds, 67% have to qualify for us to do the whole complex. And that doesn't happen very often in large apartments. But we do energy ed. I go to lots of apartments. and. Yeah, and I give them uh, light bulbs and uh, shower timers and rope caulking and things like that. So remember I told you about the CETA program in the past where they used to give out the kits, you know, the caulking and stuff? That's kind of what I do. Storm window kits, light bulbs, shower timers, caulking, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a full circle thing. The energy educator does what the original weatherization guys did, and they're doing much more advanced stuff now. How do people sign up for the... Okay, there's two ways they can go online. There's that flyer out there, and you can request a uh, application be sent to you, uh -huh. and they're bright green. We color code all of our stuff, or they I would encourage them to apply online, and that address is on that flyer, okay. and they can go there, and that gets you on our waiting list. And we're not an emergency program. Um, that's the other thing I did want to mention is oftentimes people will have an emergency. Their window got broken, the ceiling's leaking, we can't respond quickly like an emergency. We still have the, the wait list, 12 to 24 month wait, and uh, uh, the waiting factors, you know, the disabled, elderly, et cetera, uh, get uh, priority, I should say. Good question.
Um, so it used. They used to say, you know, if you weren't using an appliance, unplug it. Uh, microwave, stove, whatever. Um, is that worth it now with all of the energy efficient appliances that we're having? Is it worth going back and unplugging everything every night? Um, only uh, if it has what we call a phantom or a vampire load. And uh, these are getting worse every year. What phantom and vampire loads are are loads that... Uh, even when you turn the device off, it's still using a little bit of power. For example, um, some TVs, most TVs now, in fact, all of them have a remote control. So when you turn off the TV, it's not totally off. It's consuming a little bit of power because it has a radio receiver in there waiting for this control signal. Um, but to be an Energy Star TV, the, the uh, standby power has to be a watt or less. Um, there's a lot of devices out there that consume a lot of power and the unfortunate part is the, the biggest offenders that I see are uh, DVRs, digital video recorders, and some of the cable boxes. Some of those use 40 watts turned off. And uh, the unfortunate part is if you unplug it, then you have to reprogram it. And so you're caught in this sort of vicious circle where you got to leave it on. What I encourage folks to do is anything, if they do want to save energy like that on the phantom loads, and the average home now has like 20 to 30 phantom loads, TV, anything with a remote control, a digital clock, or uh, oftentimes indicator lights is going to have a phantom load. Uh, what I've done at my house is we have actually put in our entertainment center the things we can unplug on a power strip. And you can get these real cheaply at like Goodwill and stuff. And plug those things in that you can unplug and just flip the switch at night, same thing. I'm not gonna unplug my microwave uh, with the clock because when I plug it back in, it flashes at you and drives me <laughs> crazy. But you know what? It's sort of the tortoise and the hare race. You remember that? Um, slow and steady wins because that microwave, mine, uses over five watts all the time, 24-7, just to run the clock and the little timer thing. I might microwave a cup of coffee with 1,000 watts, but it's only two minutes. So in watt hour percentage over the course of a year, that five watts uses more than my microwave does because it's on all the time. Good questions. Um, and then speaking of the um, power strips, I'm sure you've seen the ones where it says like the main and then all of the little things. Do those actually like if you plug the TV into one and the DVD player to the other, will it shut off the power to all of the others if the TV has it on? I don't know if you've seen those. Oh, um, I have seen some of those. And again, technology is changing. Some of the earlier ones I saw were specific to that socket. So if the TV was off, you know, it was off. Um, I don't know. I believe there's models that, that do socket specific. So each device is on its own. Okay. Would you recommend those? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, again, about the apartment. If we wanted to have, like, you come out and do a educational, mm -hmm. would we have to have our manager approve, like, so that everybody in the apartment complex or whoever can attend could attend to get some information? Because I know. No. In fact, I've had some real, uh, I've had some apartment managers say, I just don't want you to come out there and stuff. But uh, uh, I don't install hardware in individual apartments, but the client ed and the light bulbs and the caulking and stuff, I give out all the time to, to each individual. And they just basically have to meet the income qualifications. That's the only requirement. Is that still on the waiting, the time wait? Uh, no, actually that can be much quicker. I, I uh, spend a lot of time. So give our office a call and- uh, And that's on? Uh, uh, yeah, the 650 what if I Summer. talked to my manager and she would said, yeah, that would be great. I have a really cool manager. Mm -hmm. And would you guys be willing to come to like the, I guess it's the gym, the office kind sure. of. You and bet. educate like a bunch of us all at once. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. Yep. Okay. No problem. All right. Well, you guys have been great. Thank you. Yeah.